Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the fourth and final Miller reading series for summer 2021. We all, of course, wish that we were down in that lovely basement with the picture that is behind Henry live <laughs> in front of us on the screen. Um, and hopefully next year we will be back there. Um, it's great to see you all here um, while not in person. Um, you know, certainly a, a, an important time as well. Um, this is, in case you are unaware, the 46th year of this series. It is one of the longest running, if not the longest running poetry series, I think it is, in Washington, D.C. Um, and this is, of course, the second year that we have been virtual. Hopefully next year we will make it back to Rock Creek Park and see some of your smiling faces um, in person. I have just a few words of housekeeping. Everyone is muted just to give poets the quiet that they need and to make sure there's no interference. Please feel free to celebrate in the chat um, by letting them know what you think of their reading. And you know we will all be monitoring that and paying attention. Feel free to ask questions and um, you know show your appreciation in all the ways. And of course, the clapping symbol as well. Um, they will also be dropping links in um, if they choose for their books. So please, as always, buy books, celebrate poets. Um, and that's, you know, important. I am starting tonight, as the advertisement said, with the unpleasant and sad, but also celebratory um, experience of trying to take a moment to recognize the loss of Venus Thrash this week. It hit me very hard, as I know it did our entire community um, from her book, you know, The Faithful Apple, which I have read several times, her work with The Word Works, with Split This Rock. She introduced me when I read at Miller Re the, the first Miller reading series that I was a part of and was so warm and welcoming. In a few years after that, I invited her to my school where she held an audience of teenagers captive for an African-American poetry reading where she was able to challenge them and welcome them. And the thing that I love the most always about Venus was how gentle her voice was and how fierce her spirit was. And so in honor of her tonight, um, I was just hoping to read one of her more recent poems called Gazebo, which has been circulating on Facebook. Um, and also I know was recently published in another Chicago magazine. So this is in her honor. Gazebo. Strange to find a simple structure standing where Tamir once played. How peaceful it appears beneath shimmering shades of maple trees surrounding it fully bloomed. Hawkmarked cement slabs line a cobblestone walkway leading to its center. Not dissimilar to footsteps caught in wet concrete, heavy as grief. Yet it isn't tragedy we dwell upon, but the boy, his unnecessary absence, his silly laughter disturbing the clouds, running haphazard and carefree through the park, skipping sidewalk cracks real and imagined, that hideous children's game, the toy gun, the quick trigger cop who can't discern a child from a grown-up, how he rises each day, shaves his murderous face in the mirror, without slicing his skin to shreds, without slitting his fucking throat. And as we all know, Venus has a lovely son, Daniel, who I've met, and all of us, you know, our hearts are with her, her family, her son. And, you know, as we go forward in poetry tonight, as she would want us to, um, I hope that we're all thinking of her and just remembering again, how lovely and beautiful and amazing she was as a poet and as a person. Um, so yes, there we go. All right, I would now like to introduce our first reader tonight. Sorry, Sandra, that we have to <laughs> make that swing, um, but here we go. Um, so if you have been anywhere around poetry in the DC area over the last decade, you absolutely are familiar with Sandra Beasley and her work. I have heard her read at IOTA and other venues over the years. Always, I come away with a sense of being surprised, being challenged um, in the collection, in the language that I was reading when I was looking over the work that she sent. You know, I just feel like her poetic vision always makes me feel larger um, for having listened to her. 
And so her bio, she is the author of Made to Explode, Count the Waves, I Was the Dupe Box, which was winner of the Barnard Women Poets Prize, Theories of Falling, winner of the New Issues Poetry Prize, and Don't Kill the Birthday Girl, Tales from an Allergic Life, a Disability Memoir. She also edited Vinegar and Char, Verse from the Southern Foodways Alliance. She lives in Southwest and is the recipient of five fellowships from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. She will welcome you with her poem. She will make you feel familiar and challenged. Please enjoy Sandra Beasley. Thank you all. What a delight to spend this time uh, with this series, with the word works, with them. Um, I mean, I, I, I can remember doing the series outside actual Miller cabin uh, and, and it's such a, that's such a beautiful introduction. I'm really honored by that. I'm also delighted to read on a night when we're celebrating Venus with whom I was a classmate uh, at American University. Uh, so anybody who's part of our MFA cohort um, will remember her presence. I was thinking about that in particular, you know, she, she, she rewarded poems that swerved, that surprised, but she also always uh, looked for, and I would say even demanded poems that earned their ending. You know, I, I think that she really was a great advocate for authenticity and heart in the poem uh, alongside quote unquote fierceness or alongside the kind of, you know, shock. Um, so I just, I, I just admired her voice tremendously. We'll continue to admire it and amplify it. And it's an honor to, to read alongside her memory tonight. Um, I'm gonna read from Made to Explode. And I thought uh, if I had to provide a thesis of this collection, it's that I was started with uh, thinking about food coming off of uh, editing Vinegar and Char and then found myself very quickly, one, wanting to get away from uh, the kind of rich food traditions and think about instead fast food, easy food, food out of a can uh, and, and from food uh, be thinking about history be thinking about cultural legacy and inheritance, particularly as it is reflected here in the DC and Virginia area. Um, this poem is called Long John Silvers. And if you happen to uh, know it, it's a Long John Silvers that is now, now closed, sadly, uh, right off um, Route 7 as it traveled through McLean. Long John Silvers. Once again, at the Long John Silvers of 1988, the rope slung walkway seems to sway under my feet as I look up at the Cape Cod with its steepled roof trimmed in yellow and lean my whole weight to the wrought iron sword that serves as a door handle. At the counter, I order a fish filet served in a folded paper treasure chest with a handful of fries to hide the secret compartment, hold the hush puppies, corn cob on the side. I carry the blue plastic tray with care to a booth paneled in the mahogany of an officer's quarters, then sit on a bench vinyled like a nautical flag. The batter is always fluffy with club soda and here no one has died yet. My teeth cut a smile into the Icelandic cod and perhaps I will go back to order a chicken plank or a tray of crunchies swept from the friar's belly, which they will give me for free. When I look back on all I've done, I want to be the person stubborn enough to found a chain of seafood shops in Lexington, Kentucky. 500 miles from any ocean named for a character in a Scottish novel. I want to admit I'm doubled over and howling, yet reach up to ring the captain's bell on my way out. So if anybody's ever been to a Long John Silver's, that it's a, that kind of transportive, often ritualized experience of a, a certain moment, a certain era, probably a certain class. Um, I, I wanted to write a poem that celebrated that along all, all the heirloom beans and fried chicken and all the other Southern traditions I was, I was navigating. 
I was just talking with a group of students earlier uh, this afternoon, and I was speaking about um, the ways in which DC is both a symbolic place and a literal place. I wanna read a, a prose poem that celebrates that. Uh, it's called Kiss Me, and it, it kind of captures the fact that before her, her passing, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an avid theater fan, which meant one could actually find themselves in the position of being in the theater with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice, which overall is a thrilling thing. It's something I experienced with more than one Supreme Court Justice, except sometimes you look up and realize the play you're all about to watch together is uh, maybe a little ironic. This poem is called Kiss Me. Ruth Bader Ginsburg sits in the 19th row of my heart while on stage, a woman has been conscribed to the shape of a shrew. The actress has 40 carat eyes and aquiline nose, her shoulders slight, her waist small enough. She is spanked over our hero's knee. Everyone is laughing except the conductor who must steady his baton and the house manager who has seen it before and the actors directed instead to be a gasp, a gape, gawking, a gog, whatever Cole Porter rhymes with dismayed and Ginsburg who adjusts the pearl clipped to her ear. She curls the program in her lap. This is tiring, attending theaters of the heart. She doesn't relish it as Sandra Day O'Connor did, sipping Prosecco at the intermission of Corgi and Bess. The gangster's soft shoe reminding us to brush up on our Shakespeare. The actress sings, I am ashamed that women are so simple. Soon, Kate will be tamed. That's how we know the ending is happy. I wanted to read um, just a, a, a poem that appeared in the packet that I submitted. Uh, it's also, you know, there's a few poems in this collection that are kind of celebrating uh, committed love. Uh, Count the Waves, my previous collection was about love across long distances. This, there's some poems in here that are like, what happens when you're sharing the same place in the case of DC life, probably an overly small apartment. Uh, and this, this poem was inspired by a, a request to write a still life poem of uh, Vanitas uh, Mort, uh, thinking about how still lives capture beauty, but they also often allude to mortality. So right alongside all those images of ripe fruit and flowers, you'll often see a fly, a leaf beginning to droop, uh, the kind of inevitable knowledges that come with commitment and, uh, uh, well, aging, frankly. Still life with sex, but first, a skull grinning amongst the grapes. But first, hydrangea moons barely risen. But first, milky bowls congregating in the sink and sticky spoons congregating in the bowls. But first, that vegetal stink. But first, clank of pipes filling with air. But first, dirt on your end of the couch. But first, dirt from your Monday shoes. But first, a canteen of water. But first, five loggers. But first, Magnum P.I. But first, Tom Selleck. But first, kiss me because you clutter the pewter. Kiss me because you track in necessary dirt. Picture a violin, then add prosciutto. We are trying to make space and hold it open. The skull that grins amongst grapes, grins at us. But first, those globes of hydrangea, there they are, perfect and cratering to our touch. That Long John Silver's poem that I opened with in a way uh, holds a, a, a thought of my grandparents often writing about food and about American history and cultural inheritance caused me to think about my grandparents' generation this was an, an elegy for my, uh, my grandmother, Jean Pruitt. Card table. A practical gift for moving to the city. Good cherry squared around black vinyl, four long legs that fold within itself, 
as a greyhound does, disappearing into a nap. Just big enough for a bridge match, if I'd ever had four people willing to kiss knees. Just big enough to let me call a corner of that S Street studio my breakfast nook, stacked with a week's worth of newspapers while I ate cereal cross-legged on my futon. Just big enough to pull out every few years and complain how small the table was, too crowded as a desk, too low for my chairs. In January, we stared at the strange space wedged between two kitchen doorways. Might as well try the card table. We stacked onions there, then potatoes, then tomatoes and peaches, and it became the chopping table, stirring table, serving table. Now, the first morning she is gone, I see a swipe in the vinyl where a hot dish burned through and realize I forgot to ask for anything, a ring, her sheet music. So what I have is this reminder that she too was once a girl in a city and that she knew I'd always need a table. I think I might have read that poem um, at uh, Iota. I think I read an early, uh, an early draft of that poem at Iota. Uh, I want to just be uh, mindful of, of everyone's time. And, and so I'll just uh, I'll finish by reading um, a poem called Say the Word. And I want to mention, um, you know, I, food allergies is something that, ironically, I, I write about love of food, and then I write about being allergic to a bunch of foods. And in recent years, I've thought a lot about uh, thinking about the, the politics around food allergies and around disability, and really thinking about the ways in which uh, often our problems are rooted not in the disabilities or the illnesses themselves, but how those around us fail to be able to accommodate or include us uh, on account of them. Uh, and so I wanna read a, a poem called Say the Word. And it comes from me doing a deep dive into thinking about the origin of disability. Now, I'm not gonna argue that this is the technical origin, but there's a kind of convergence where when you look back, you run across this pater, uh, who, is, who would be an ancient, um, an ancient Roman god, kind of the predecessor of, of what we would talk about with Hades or someone as a ruler of the underworld. And I loved the idea of taking a disability, which is so often defined as a, a lack of an ability or a lack of power and kind of reactivating it as a, as a very powerful figure. So the, the title of his poem, uh, Say the Word, is a, that's a, a phrase, a hashtag phrase that pops up um, in the disability community that kind of welcomes that, that euphemism or claiming disability versus other euphemisms. Say the word. To be apart, I'm told, to be asunder, to be a privative, negative, reversing force, to be reached only by oaths and curses, to have black sheep sacrificed in my name because I'm a god, yes, as we are all gods on occasion, to be bodied as I am bodied, to be rich of earth, which is to be chronically chthonic, to be where the gems are underground, to be dis, to be dis, to be dis, to reject any pickaxe disguised as love. All right, I wanna thank you all for your time and I'm so looking forward to hearing my fellow poets tonight. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, you know, the specificity of your images is something I think of always. And that, but first, but first, but first, having been married, completely can recognize where that's coming from. So lovely, and thank you so much. Um, our, our next reader will be Bonnie Naradzi. Um, a little bit about Bonnie. She has led poetry workshops at the DC Women's Jail a day shelter for homeless people, and at a retirement center, all in Washington, DC. Recent poems of hers appeared in Agni, New Letters, and the Kenyon Review, among other publications. In 2010, she was awarded the New Orleans MFA Programs Poetry Prize, 
and was given a month's stay in the castle of Ezra Pound's daughter in Northern Italy. That sounds like a stunning and amazing experience. Um, in Bonnie's poems, I enjoy the voice of the poet reflecting on her process. A number of hers in her packet had to do with how these poems are put together. And I always am fascinated by the idea of the poet thinking about her poems while constructing her poems. And I hope that you will enjoy probably some of those poems and her other work as you listen to Bonnie tonight. So welcome, Bonnie. I would like to start with a poem from the packet. And, um, and it's, uh, it's to Stanley Plumley, who taught in this area for a very long time and died um, a few years ago in the summer. It's called Lament for the Maker, which, as you likely know, um, came from W.S. Merwin. And the epigraph is from Plumley's final poem. Close your eyes for too long and you can be gone. He said, put yourself in the poem that I had written about the potato famine in Ireland. Have you been there, he asked. Yes, I said, to Dingle on the peninsula where sheep graze and the blaskets where seals bob in the shadows. But he was drawn into dark tides of his own and clearing his throat, he asked, can you film the scene? Stay in the moment, be a guide, for you can't just disappear in the poem or let your mind get lost in memories. Poetry is a meditation and a looking back, he said, and there are only six shapes in nature and one is the meander. Don't be in a hurry to send out poems, he said, let it take years. It's awful when you can't get what you want. What matters most is how pain can weigh you down. And then you must start all over again. Thank you. So I do want to read a few others that are in the packet. I'm going to <laughs> read something that, um, <clears throat> something that happened um, after, um, a session at the Writer Center in Bethesda. And this is called Sunday Afternoon at Don Pollos, which, which you may know because it's right around the corner from the Writer Center. Four women of a certain age, we are gathered at Don Pollos to read aloud our latest poems. With Pam stating that hers, in case we missed it, is on sexual awakening. Digging into spit roasted chicken, we mention ex-husbands. Norma says she'll like hers more after he dies. And this reminds me to outlive mine so he doesn't get my, his hands on my pension. A Moroccan soccer player just now on the big TV, whips off his wild shirt after he scores, staring transfixed at his rippling chest and abdomen. I fumble for words to explain how seeing his hand, hard, bared body affects me, while Linda, having already talked of her new decisiveness in the garden, now that she's 60, her freedom to uproot plants if they don't fit in, says it's all on the talk shows now. It's what women want. So now I wonder what it is. And I remember that guy at Squaw Valley who talked of tantric bliss. When I was younger, I tell them, while eating bread pudding from a styrofoam plate, it was always the high-minded Renaissance man who caught my attention. What a disaster. Once more, I glance up at the soccer game. Do I see Apollo's torso, his smiling hips, his thighs, 
are the nameless oarsmen who rowed Odysseus to shore. Thank you. So I have a few more here. And um, good. So just to say that the next one um, is called Summer of Love. And there's a um, um, epigraph from Dante's Inferno. And um, the epigraph is, E detto lo perché dole ti debia. And I just want to let you know that the last line of the poem is a translation of that line in English. Uh, and just to let you know that we're talking about the 1960s and I'm in graduate school. So that's the setting. In our Somerville rental, the brown paper bag near our kitchen sink was filled with a week's midden heaps. Sodden garbage rotted on the floor and maggots impersonating rice writhed free. Pulverized garlic, which we wore in our socks, stalked through our nightmares while we slept. By daylight, strange fumes leapt from our tongues. Our Siamese cat in heat streaked out the door. Lowell told our King James Bible class he was off to Brazil, but he only got as far as McLean Hospital in Belmont for a cure. I was the night attendant who dozed in the hallway propped against the wall. Alba, the promising dropout, lit hash on our stove and sucked up the smoke through a rolled up 50. He stole my Chaucer, Keats, and Bede and sold them to the used book emporium in Central Square. Weekends up in Vermont, we gathered sheaves of marijuana from the VFW's front yard and dried the lot in a laundromat. We sold it all in tie-dyed bags at steep discounts. Leaves curled like little fists inside. By summer's end, there was nothing we believed in. Yam sprouted vines that crawled away from us and Banchati could not keep us awake. And I have told you this to make you grieve. Thank you. So, all right, one or two more here. And um, so, so here's another from the packet. And I have to say, I wanna say that this poem called Getting There is after Kavafi, and specifically it's after Kavafi's poem, Ithaca. And uh, this is one of my all-time favorites. And uh, um, so yes, I did have this time in uh, Northern Italy in uh, the castle belonging to Ezra Pound's daughter, Mary. And part of the trip involved, or the gift or the award involved a, a trip of several days to Venice because Pound really liked Venice and he lived there for a while. And he was buried very close to uh, Joseph Brodsky who had fresh red roses on his gravesite. He was buried in a place called the Island of the Dead, Isola de San Marco. And that's because during plague times, the Venetians put, uh, buried all their plague victims on the Island of the Dead. And eventually it started um, including more people, but in the meantime, the people were built, buried in stacks and, and they had to be dug up and removed. But anyway, that's not in the point. Getting there. Do not hurry your journey to the Isola de San Marco, better than at last for years. So you come laden with thoughts of all you've lost along the way while you embark on the crowded Vaporetto from Venice, the city now swathed in scaffolding, sinking into its canals. As you eat fried calamari wrapped in paper, 
spot at the dock. The boat will chug past Torcello with its poppy fields, malarial swamps, lagoons, the wall covered in mosaics showing scenes from revelations. Rejoice now that you are old when you first approach it from the water, for it has always been on your mind. When you finally step ashore, you will walk through ancient heaps of bones, and then you'll come upon the old Franciscan church rising from stones. At its door, stone angels will greet you. Inside, monks tend the candlelit reliquary. Otherwise, you could not know such peace exists in this world of seagulls, lizards, and hooded crows. I have uh, a few more. One is called Lines, which is a pantoum, a pandemic pantoum. This has been done before, standing in line for a long time. Think of Soviet women who queued for hours for bread. And I have learned about the lines of the Great Depression. Men lined up for mind-numbing jobs at assembly lines. Think of Soviet women who stood for hours for bread or Akhmatova outside the prison waiting for news of her son. Here are men lined up for mind-numbing jobs at assembly lines. These days, some have it easy. Food deliveries, yoga online. Akhmatova outside the prison waited with women for news and the chance to send a loaf of bread or a note inside. These days, some have it easy, food deliveries, yoga online. Still, Camus said, the plague is within us, here to stay. I have learned about the lines of the Great Depression, where hope is a loaf of bread, a note arriving inside. Camus said the plague is within us, here to stay, as it has always done, waiting in line for a long time. I have a few more, three. This is one called One-Sided Conversation. I don't know whether you have read about the man in Japan who built a telephone booth with glass sides uh, with a disconnected phone so that people could talk to their relatives who have died or disappeared. One-sided conversation. In Japan, in a small booth with a disconnected rotary phone on a hill overlooking the Pacific, a man calls into the wind through the receiver to his dead cousin, whom he misses terribly and who died before the tsunami arrived. Now the man offers his phone booth to the relatives of those who are dead or just missing out there somewhere. People come from all over to use the phone. I can't hear him, but he heard me, a woman said of her son who died in a fire. I can go on living now. I have one last poem. Thank you. All right, sorry, two more. This is just another short one. And um, it's um, completely based on phrases from Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. I've written about six of these and they're based on uh, Ann Carson's Nay Rather, which is um, a series of translations of uh, fragment 286 by Ibikos ancient Greek poet. And what she did was she took the framework of the poem to, um, on which to pin her translations. And the first one is an exact one, why I am here. And this is based on King's letter from the Birmingham city jail. In Birmingham, on the one hand, early Christians being willing to face hungry lions where a higher law was involved, while white mothers screaming 
on television were seen. On the other hand, for me, an unjust law distorts the soul. Nay, rather, like a code inflicted on a minority, created with unjust methods, parading without a permit. On its face, nothing wrong. Man's tragic separation. And so I'll just end with the Heiko at the Day Shelter for the Homeless. Uh, yeah, I've been leading poetry groups around the city. And um, for years I went every week to a place called Miriam's Kitchen, downtown DC, until the pandemic hit. And then they moved everything outdoors. And, and so I haven't been able to go back. So this is for the people I miss so much. And it's called Haiku at the Day Shelter for the Homeless. This morning, we read Haiku. Not just Basho, whose name means plantain tree, and Issa, whose name means cup of tea. But also Richard Wright, born in Mississippi, who later moved to France and wrote thousands of haikus in his final years. When I said Wright followed the strict syllable count, Leon asked, what are syllables? I began to count the sounds on my fingers. The crow flew so fast that he left his lonely caw. Two people liked this one by Issa. Once in the box, every one of them is equal. The chess pieces. Eugenia wrote about three women, regulars here, who died from drugs in the past few weeks. Now in a box, she wrote, naming each of them in her poem. Alessandro, responding to Basho, wrote about constellations of stars. And for the first time this year, Robert, tattooed up and down his arms, was awake and sublimely alert. He liked Issa's, the distant mountains are reflected in the eye of the dragonfly. In his eyes, I saw myself reflected too. And over the long, lonely fields, the crow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I feel as if we went on a little bit of tour of history and parts of Europe and ended up, you know, often in Japan as well. Um, I particularly like the pandemic poem. I too have been thinking a lot about lines that we all hear is that's been a hardship compared to what so many people have faced for so long. Um, so thank you for those poems. Um, our final reader tonight is Miss Cayenne. And I will tell you a little about her. She is an author, performer, facilitator, coach, and entrepreneur. She loves all things artsy. She has been known to write, sing alto, alto with several musical groups and facilitate dynamic hands-on workshops for academic and corporate settings. But her first love is poetry. Uh, she has hosted a number of readings around DC and currently hosts an open mic at Bus Boys and Poets in Anacostia on the third Tuesday night of every month from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, when I looked through her packet of poems and read a bit of her work, I was just really ready for someone to come and preach. I'm just in, in those poems, I'm hearing that powerful voice. Um, when I read Grass Don't Grow in the Ghetto, I just felt really, really strongly that we were going to hear some powerful language tonight. And so I hope that, I hope she'll read that poem um, and many of her others as well. So welcome, Miss Cayenne. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and share but moreover to hear and to listen and like you said um kind of get a, a historical uh tour through poetry so it's always a pleasure always a highlight to my long days to have poetry involved 
Um, as say, stated, I'm Miss Cayenne. I'm a poet and I know it. I like to consider myself an eclectic poet, but I do think there are some themes that seem to surface uh, more often than not. And I thought today what I'll do is um, share a little bit about myself and my eclecticism, if you will, by way of my poetry. And there are three major things for me that I'll highlight perhaps through my poetry. And one of them is, as I said in my bio, I love poetry. I, you know, it's my first love. And it's my first love because it served uh, as a healing balm for me so many times in my life. Um, and so that's one, poetry is uh, therapeutic and cathartic. Uh, in addition to that, um, I find poetry as a wherewithal to be a voice for the unheard. Um, and those who may not have space to be heard or marginalized populations or stories that are often shoved under the carpet. So I use poetry in that way. And then thirdly, I'm a person of faith, a woman of faith, and that always comes through uh, as well as my poetry. So I'll, I'll just give you that tidbit. Um, and I was looking for a piece that I wanted, I was wanted to share, but I don't, I don't, I don't see it readily. So I won't uh, trip myself up with that one. I wrote, um, I put together a book called Syncopated Hearts. It's a small chat book and you can, I do have my website, I believe. If I don't, I'll put it there uh, in the chat and you can reach out to me from there to see if you can get a copy, but mostly it's out of print. We can try to get some more print, but this is um, from my chat book, Syncopated Hearts, and it's called That Table. Um, uh, in 2013, I lost my grandmother who was probably the most uh, one of the most important pillars in my life. And so, as I said before, poetry has been a healing uh, place for me and it's how I process, right? And so this is called That Table. Um, I think someone mentioned a table earlier, Sandra, I believe. And so I thought, oh, how, how apropos. That Table. Boston Market catered my turkey day this year. Though grateful for the $22.41 needed to purchase this tasty meal, I was saddened that it was not prepared by her hands, served from her dishes, consumed at her table. In fact, that table is gone, loaded on a truck with careless quickness. That table used to hold meals prepared in love. That table used to shelter the dogs from scolding tones. That table held mail sent to me years after I had moved away. That table now sits in a goodwill with unfamiliar pieces of furniture, questioning what it did to deserve this relocation, this transition from a warm purpose-filled home to a cold, warehouse floor, that table. Hid my dangling feet during long prayers for traveling mercies before driving back to my college dorm. That table served as a church and office where sermons were prepared and community prayer meetings were held. That table endured the pressure of the pen from letters written to local officials, congressmen, and other entities of power demanding that a wrong be made right. That table. That table covered with cloth and plastic upheld hundreds of candles during countless birthday celebrations. That table hosted my family's last supper before its matriarch pushed away from it for the last time. That table absorbed the fragrance of her spirit early that Sunday morning when it left her body floating from her bedroom to the cumulus clouds of heaven. That table, though nameless, held everything in its wooden DNA, resilience, tenacity, dedication, second chances, faith, and agape. That table held me up when my balance was challenged. That table never changed, despite life's duplicity, so in whatever bleak, warehouse corner that table now stands. The effulgent truth is that its life was well lived. That table, that table. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm still getting used to the silence of our Zoom um, readings, but I love feeling and seeing the energy nonetheless. Another piece I'm going to read um, speaks to uh, a very pivotal point in my life. It's an old piece. Um, it's not located in any of the books that, I sh that are in the chat, but it's an old piece um, on 2005. It's a crazy story. You'll read about it one day in, in, in some memoir of mine, but I was reconnected with my father uh, for the first time after one time meeting him when I was 12. So I was probably mid thirties at that time and, uh, or early thirties. And I traveled to Ghana, to West Africa, where my father and my father's family is from for the first time meeting him, meeting my family there. And it was a very, um, robust experience full of emotion and things of that nature but um this piece in, in my reflection of my experiences just living as an african-american woman uh and then now getting connected to my african family and roots um and my experiences there just kind of this is a um, the outcome one of the outcomes uh, called i am africa and hopefully you can hear it's a little sing-songy i am africa from sun-scorched castle walls, out of blood-stained dungeons, I hear whispers of ancestors. I am Africa, Africa I am, I am Africa, remember. I too have been burned from the heat of life's mishaps. I too have witnessed my own blood spilling onto the pavement, seeping into the dirt, and from the earth, my life whispers, I am Africa, Africa I am, I am Africa, remember. With physical shackles, my mind is bound, mental bondage incarcerates the heart. A heart behind bars is a soul rape of hope, apartheid. I am Africa, Africa I am, remember. Them over there, us over here, our land became stolen land, now a contaminated land makes it a sad land. Annihilation, segregation, separation, fake integration, tolerization, superstition, intermission, slow gratification, hopeful sensation, apartheid. See, I too am Africa, Africa I am, I remember. In a dream one day, I saw the imprints of dusty dark travelers. Behold, elaborate golden thrones. I bow before kings. I mingled among royalty. And from hidden speakers, I could hear a chorus singing, I am Africa, Africa I am, I am Africa, remember. In a dream today, I dream today. I see myself a dark, dusty traveler traveling my narrow path of purpose. I see myself walking, standing, sitting upon my throne, my throne of destiny, golden and unique to me, my throne, and quietly in my mind, I pontificate. I am Africa. Africa I am, I am Africa. I will never forget. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to um, read an, a piece from a collection called The Right Blend. I'll show it to you. Um, hopefully it's clear enough in the visual there. Um, if, and that link is in the chat as well. You can go to amazon.com and look up the right blend. Of course, the word right is a play on the word right. Um, and it's I'm a part of a uh, poetry ensemble or a poetry circle of six poets in the DMV area who are diverse in our voice, in our styles, in our cultures, in our ages, in our height. I'm probably the shortest one in that group. Um, and so we, we, see, we love to come together and write and utilizing the, the, the the differences, right? That is where we land and come together. And the differences, our diversity, 
has become so enriching. And so we've put together our first collection called The Right Blend. Um, I like this collection, not just because I'm a part of it, but I like it because of the diversity. And in a time uh, that we're in, uh, if, if no other time is now to uh, push past differences and find where we can connect and where we are not that much different after all. And so in here, we get a taste of poetry um, from, our, from our diverse sounds and voices, but yet coming together on the theme of colors and so and blendedness. And so if you get this book, you'll see different chapters. Uh, each chapter talks about the blending of something, the blending of voices, blending of colors, and our poems uh, all speak to those different themes. This piece I'm going to read called Broken Glass. Um, Broken Glass was inspired literally by walking in my, uh, in a DC neighborhood, in a DC neighborhood, and walking my dogs, um, or my dog at the time, I have two now, uh, dog at the time. Uh, but, you know, I'm a poet, so we get inspiration from all kinds of things, called Broken Glass. The glass shards smeared in the most conspicuous places prohibit little boys and little girls from barefoot races and ice cream truck chases on a hot summer's day. On a hot summer's day, everywhere I go, there's shattered glass on the ground. Though I never hear the sound, I'm always forced to tiptoe around the transparent jagged edges. Transparent jagged edges direct my long walk home in the hood. Certain streets are not traveled because it's understood that if I don't want to get cut, I better do what anyone would, choose a less dangerous route. A less dangerous route doesn't mean no glass. It just means a less chance of a whoop-ass encounter. I walk past streetlights that make the glass sparkle like abandoned jewels in a dusty treasure chest. A dusty treasure chest is home to me now. So when in Rome, broken glass is not litter, but rather a dome that has fallen from above like spiked raindrops. Spiked raindrops beneath my feet feels like stinging teardrops against my cheeks. It shines like gold, but it's really glistening defeat. Yet that light somehow leads me through a pathway home. A pathway home paved with the remnants of Greg Goose, Samuel Adams, 40s, and some bright indigo blue. Winos and drunkards do what they do, breaking their bottles in homage to whoever will listen. Whoever will listen, that's who the glass pieces on the ground are for. Jesus stopped listening three rehabs ago and their thesis statement is filled with fragmented glass sentences and inebriated metaphors. <laughs> a little dangle there right at the end. Don't know where we're going, but that's that piece called Broken Glass. Um, and often I find myself uh, writing, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a poet um, by passion and a social worker by profession. So I've, I'm often uh, moved and bothered and inspired by social issues. And they are also things that come up for me in my poetry. And so our wonderful host and moderator indicated uh, she appreciated the poem, Grass Don't Grow in the Ghetto. So I thought maybe I'll read that tonight as well. Um, <laughs> Let me make sure I have the right. I don't think I, I don't think that I pinpointed it out. Let me make sure, here we go. All right, here we go. Grass don't grow in the ghetto. This was actually written um, in, uh, not too long after Michael Brown's situation where he was shot and um, his life uh, taken and uh, you know, there are often times, obviously, in our in our world where things happen that move us and pivot us, hopefully, ideally, on to change for the better. Um, takes a little time, but this was inspired, and it's interesting, that was years ago, and um, while there, it was some time ago, there is still some relevance, clearly. Um, and it's called Grass Don't Grow in the Ghetto. 
Glass glistens where grass is supposed to grow. Gruesome grooves pierce the ground, jutting upward like black fists, punching stale air. Sharp petal flowers memorialize dreams, wishes, and whispers of hope. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why grass don't grow in the ghetto. Gaping gashes sets his face aglow in the afterglow of a grappling with the popo. Gory glimpses of his faded glory is merely a glimmer in his flittering eyes. Groping for the remnants of his vitality, his slips through his fingers, and his mother curses the fingers that pulled the trigger. They shot my son, mowed down like blades of green grass growing towards a glaring sun. My son, his spirit pierces white clouds, thrust upward like a black fist, punching stale air. Still can't figure out why grass don't grow in the ghetto. His homies pour libations, one sip for you, 10 gulps for me, believing that the bloodstained tree roots next to the yellow tape and the white chalk silhouette would serve as his esophagus delivering liquid resurrection power. But before he could rise from the dead, his home is a wash away urban poetry with hot spit and hot piss, leaving nothing behind but shattered liquor bottles and the stench of dreams deferred. You're still wondering why grass don't grow in the ghetto? Our sprinkler system spews putrid defeat. We fertilize our seeds with maggot-filled cow chips and avaricious dung, AKA some real stinky shit. We eat our young and throw up our old, killing our future while immortalizing our past. We excuse hate when the hater is the hunter and a little black boy is the bait. Grass can't grow in the ghetto as long as grass stays greener on the other side. As long as economical, medical, and educational divides are wider than the spans between our eyes glass, will continue to glisten where grass is supposed to grow until our so-called social services becomes true human services, until our equality is no longer a no-go, but something that we do know going forward, until our narcissistic greed ceases to be our ladder and the lives of little black boys and little black girls, they really do matter. But in the meantime, we'll politic and pontificate and perseverate the problems that plague the brown people, ignoring the glass that glistens where grass is supposed to grow, acting like we just can't figure out why grass don't grow in the ghetto. That's that piece, that's that piece. Um, a little jarring, a little jarring, and, and again, you know, just a call, to call for us to to do better, <laughs> to do better. I'm gonna read two more pieces. I think I think I have time for two more. I think I have time for two more. Um, cool. I'm actually gonna read a brand new, like when I say brand new, this week kind of brand new. Um, I am the facilitator of a face group, face group, Facebook group, excuse me, called Poets, Writers, and Creative Scribblers. And every Wednesday we have something called Words on Wednesdays. And there's a writing prompt that we have the next seven days to respond to anybody who wants to that's in the group can respond to it and share and then we share on the next on the following Wednesday. This group was started as a way as a wherewithal to keep me accountable as a poet to write so I throw out words to people that give me some oh no they throw words back at me and then I would write something and I would share it. And that was my accountability and that morphed into a Facebook group feel free to join uh, be a part of it there's and that's the one words on Wednesday is, is the 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 meat of it and uh, this writing prompt the the front ender was what did those blinds do to you blinds like window blinds what did those blinds do to you and here's that piece literally just this week so a little work in progress but I'm going to share it tonight what did those blinds do to you hmm Concluding me in my transformative state, blinding me with cluelessness of the date and the day, shutting out distractions and harm, 
an unassuming force field and a super sturdy soft shield those blinds pause time giving me time to heal sheltering me from the heat of an insensitive sun openly opening only for the moon's lulling when the day was done patiently waiting for me and my readiness to return to that time when I'd twist my fingers and turn that clear rod on the side, letting in the noise of the world again. Those blinds cause my pain. Well, not really, but it contained my bleeding, redirecting my tearing to my feet, AKA my knees, blocking whispers in the ears of everyone else's opinion. Those blinds gave me protection from the weather and the wind, enclosing me within the holy of holies, despite my light being dim. Those blinds, without rushed tones, spoke ever so quietly to my brittle, broken bones, promising me that my good mornings, promising me that my good mornings were not just meaningless rhetoric, promising me that my liquid muscles would return to me and could handle it. Those blinds gave me time. Those blinds gave me time and in due season gave me reason to take on the day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So my last piece, I mentioned earlier, I'm a woman of faith and um, it, it all, as a matter of fact, that's probably when I first began to write, it was a little dark, but then, you know, it would always morph into leading me back to my particular, my faith. And so um, this is a piece that I wrote called Worship. And I'm always chicken to do this piece because um, it involves a little uh, vocalization, and that's not where I feel comfortable, but I'm going to share it because, again, it's a part of who I am as a person, and it's important to me, and it comes through in my poetry uh, as well. Um, this is called Worship. Worship, my morning fix. While suited addicts bombard their local Starbucks for their daily dose of liquid crack, <laughs> I raise my bruised arm to the sky. Bruised from life's injections and heavy burdens. Burdens I took a long time to realize because they weren't even mine to bear. He said his yoke is easy and his burdens are light. Yeah, worship. My morning fix. You see, it's where my day starts. In a small, cozy corner of my heart, weak whispers of thanks rolled up into my tongue. Then my supplier lights a fire and I inhale. My mind is free and my heart is full, full of adoration and full of appreciation. It no longer matters where I've been, but where I am in his presence. It's the very essence of why I live, move, and have my being. You are the air I breathe. Worship. It's my midday getaway. It's my step away from my desk, eat lunch in my car, lock the bathroom door, vacate. See, I'm like a junkie. I'm hooked on him. I can't get enough of him. And all I want is more of you. See, I'm like a junkie. I'm hooked on him. I can't get enough of him. And all I want is more of you. Nothing I desire, Lord, but more of you. More of you. Worship. It's my midday must have. His voice is like a healing salve to my troubled soul, a two-way exchange because as I lift him, he makes me whole. As I behold him, he changes the mold. We more like him. I can't get enough of him. I just want to be close to him. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you is my 
desire. Yeah, 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 yeah. Worship. It's my midnight urge. See, the day is done, and I need another surge from the Holy One, the Righteous One, my only one. I love him unconditionally, and he loves me uncontrollably. He part of the sea of tears surrounding me, yet in this moment, it has nothing to do with me. I said, I love him unconditionally, and he loves me uncontrollably. He parted the sea of tears surrounding me, yet in this moment, it has nothing to do with me because you are sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. You are higher than the highest mountain man has ever known. You shine brighter than the brightest star in the dark of night. You are God. That's more than enough, more than amazing and better than super, greater than outstanding, God is. More than amazing, better than super, greater than outstanding, God is the joy and the strength of my life. <laughs> Worship, it's my everyday fix. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Cayenne. And I believe the word I used at the beginning was perhaps you were going to preach. So I think that's very fitting that you ended right there. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Sandra, as well as Bonnie. You guys were all fabulous. And this is now coming to the end of our terrific reading. I have enjoyed every single moment of the poems and the sharing, and it really is I believe, as Sandra said, a beautiful community. You were talking about that in the chat, that all of us are here supporting each other, um, both in all that is happening in the world and in all that we are grieving and also all that we are finding to be joyful about all together um, with this language. So thank you so much for that. A couple of announcements. Please be sure if you are interested, the words work, WordWorks Cafe Muse will hold a special reading Monday, July 12th. Um, we will be having poems from the Ar anthology about Arlington, and that will involve Catherine Young and other readers. And then Henry's um, group, Poets versus the Pandemic, will be held again on Wednesday, July 21st, also at 7 p.m. And we will hear from Miles David Moore, Lucinda Marshall, and Ann Becker. I know at least Miles is here, so please go hear Miles. That would be terrific. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I believe that Henry will one more time put into the chat um, if you're interested in supporting the um, GoFundMe for Venus, you're welcome to do that. Um, it is in order to raise money for a scholarship and to support Black literature. So she's po posting that as well. And it's been lovely to see you all. I hope that we will all come across one another again at poetry venues, both on Zoom and in person. And thanks a lot. It was great to hear you all. Have a good night.